first speaker will be uh, Antonio Jarquín Laguna. And the, the bio reads like this. Um, Antonio Jarquín Laguna received his uh, uh, bachelor's in engineer, engineering in mechanical engineering from the National University of Mexico in 2007. Then he got his uh, master in science uh, degree in sustainable energy from Delft University of Technology in Delft, the Netherlands in uh, 2010. And he, he got his uh, PhD from the same institution in 2017. Uh, Dr. Harkin Laguna is uh, currently working as an assistant professor at the Department of Maritime and Transport Technology from Delft University of Technology. His research interests include offshore renewables, energy storage solutions, and physical modeling. So you're uh, very welcome, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Harkin Laguna, and um, perhaps you uh, you have been advised that the lecture is expected to, to last around uh, 40 minutes and uh, 35 to 40 minutes, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Osvaldo, please help me in, in this respect. And then we will have some minutes for, for uh, uh, questions and discussion. Uh, am I correct? 40 minutes with five to question and answers. Good, excellent. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for being with us. And um, uh, Professor Harkin Laguna, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and I hope uh, you can see it now. Yeah, so please let me know if uh, for any reason you cannot see it or there's a problem, but, um, but uh, okay. I can, I, see, I will... I can see your screen very well, thank you. Perfect. So I, I will start with this uh, talk that I prepared for this workshop. Um, this time I prepared something different, uh, which is more about how the offshore wind uh, industry somehow can support the conventional oil and gas sector. And um, this is something I'm um, working with one of the PhD students uh, at the University of Delft. Um, he is from Brazil, Andre Novgorod's chef uh, junior, and he has been working also most of his uh, life in the oil and gas sector, and now he's also now moving towards the renewable energy sector. And um, as I mentioned before, um, this time I'll, I'll try to do the story the other way around. Normally we go from oil and gas, we are trying to shift towards uh, renewables, and uh, this time I will also mention why it's important that uh, we also use these renewables back to the oil and gas and what are the synergies and opportunities. Um, after that, I'll talk a bit about some of the energy storage uh, solutions we have looked at for making this happen. And in particular, one of the proposed ideas we have at UDELF that we have been, uh, what we are currently working in uh, which is a subsea buoyancy gravity energy storage system, but um, I will say a bit more in, in a few minutes. Um, well, I know you are an institute working on renewable energy, so there is no uh, really not much need to, to explain the motivation of why we need these renewable energies, right? Um, we are almost 8 billion people, energy demand is uh, increasing. Um, there's also kind of a strong political background uh, where countries want to be energy independent and, and do not depend on the natural gas from Russia, for example, or from other, uh, from other countries. Uh, and uh, most urgently, and what we see in the media probably is, uh, and that, that concerns us uh, all, is, is the climate change. And uh, how are we going to um, reach our goals to limit the rise of temperatures to 1.5 degrees by, uh, by 2050. The, the good news is that it is possible and uh, with the technology we have, uh, but in order to do that, we require to have emissions by 2030. And uh, we also need to incorporate and grow the installation of renewable energy plants as, uh, in a very intensive and aggressive manner. 
Um, a bit of a, uh, news is that at the moment we are not on track. Um, and uh, I think it's important to mention that next week, uh, the next uh, COP meeting is going to take place in, uh, in the UK, together, I think, with Italy. So it will be very important what is going to be discussed there if we want to really meet, meet our targets. Um, and uh, well, this is more or less what's, what's the plan. Uh, and you can see from this plan that the role of renewable energy in the power sector is very important. And um, especially if you look at uh, the contribution uh, of uh, offshore wind, uh, of wind energy in general, but both uh, offshore and even floating wind is considered in these scenarios. Of course, these are scenarios that are um, proposed and uh, suggested by some of the consultancy, con uh, uh, some consultancies. Um, and, and, and you can also see how in, in, in the general sense, we were moving out of, um, of fossil fuels, at least for electricity production. Um, looking at this, probably almost one, um, more than half of the, of, the, of, the, of the energy production or electricity production, let me put it like that, will come from renewable energy sources. Um, but I think this is something you might already knew. But I, I, I will come back to this in a bit. The, the other reason is that, uh, of course, these technologies and in particular um, solar photovoltaics and wind energy are becoming cheaper. And now they are even competitive in many markets with, uh, if we compare them with the conventional fossil fuels. Um, and you can also see how um, much reduction has been achieved in the last 10 years. Um, you can see it for, for offshore winds and, um, and onshore winds, how, how this decrease has uh, been of more than 50% in the last 10 years. And uh, well, of course, you can see solar photovoltaic is uh, probably three or four times bigger than that. But uh, this trend will continue with all the developments. And uh, then it kind of becomes a positive uh, feedback loop in which uh, the use of renewables will uh, be no. Uh, will be just there. So I think it, I'm convinced we are moving in, in, in the coming years to this renewable energy um, society, and that's what we call the energy transition. And a lot of things are happening, um, and in particular in the offshore wind industry. Uh, this is already a reality where we are installing hundreds of very, very big offshore wind turbines uh, at sea uh, in very big foundations in deeper waters, far on shore, and this development is going to continue at least for the, until 2050. And you can see here, where are we now and how much is left? So this industry will just continue to grow. And um, the, uh, here in Europe, uh, well, it's taking the lead and the North Sea is just now becoming full of uh, offshore wind farms. Um, so just to give you also some numbers to have an idea of this. And um, at the moment, um, you can see that uh, in Europe, we have 25 gigawatt installs of offshore wind capacity. And there's also some potential, not only in Europe, but also in, in North America, Latin America, Asia, and uh, of course, in uh, Oceania. Uh, at the moment, in, uh, in the whole American continent, we have uh, zero offshore wind capacity. But uh, the US will start. This is also some uh, from the news uh, last week. So the Biden administration already is, uh, is looking for, uh, for tenders. And, I, and if everything goes fine, I think by 2025, they will start with uh, also offshore wind developments. Um, and uh, well, and the question is also if, if Mexico, for example, can go to such, uh, to, to start, uh, you know, installing offshore wind, uh, offshore wind energy. And um, well, there's a lot of work uh, to do. Um, you also see how the, the whole expectations for all the world. And uh, these are the current trends. I noticed that uh, um, last week you also had uh, in this in these uh, workshops you also had a nice presentation. I think from Vanessa uh, telling all the developments that are happening in, with respect to offshore wind. Um, but I think the, the two major ones, at least, is in one, 
scaling it up, getting bigger uh, wind turbines, uh, going into multi gigawatt wind farms. So these are no longer small power plants. These are really uh, equivalent to nuclear power plants in terms of installed capacity above one gigawatt and how to interconnect uh, several countries with all this power. Uh, and the other developments has to do with uh, floating offshore winds and going into deeper waters where we can have better exploitation of the wind, uh, wind resource. And in order to do that, of course, we also need important developments in the technologies behind the floating structures, the moorings, the anchors, the dynamic cables. Um, and uh, lately also there's this hot topic on hydrogen production at sea. So what are the synergies of uh, connecting that with, uh, with offshore wind? Uh, so these are the current trends that I think uh, uh, where a lot of research is uh, happening and what uh, both industry and academia are, are looking into. Um, but let's not forget one, one small thing that uh, even though we are moving towards this uh, renewable, uh, let's say um, power uh, electricity in green energy system, um, all this here is still to stay for many years. Uh, and here you can see the graphs, not on electricity, but in primary energy demand. And what you see here is that uh, still by 2050, even half of it will still come from fossil fuels. So, the, I mean, it's, it's just to be realistic in the expectations we could have. And that uh, saying that, well, yes, the, the oil and gas industry will be there. They will, of course, produce less oil and gas, but it's still an important contribution. And you see now from the role of renewables that now from 2020, it's probably in a, a few percentage in the whole primary energy supply and their important role it will have by 2050, probably one, one third. But still there's a lot to say about this 50% coming from oil, um, from oil uh, or from fossil fuel sources. And uh, well, uh, probably uh, you know that uh, all most of the offshore wind developments, uh, a lot of the experience and knowledge also comes from the oil and gas industry that has been there uh, already for several decades. And uh, there's a, a lot of also very important uh, technology trends there. And 25% of all the oil and gas in the world is also produced offshore. So this is also very, very important uh, to mention, uh, especially also in the Mexican context, because, um, well, uh, probably you know that our contribution uh, with the renewables is very little, and we have a, an economy that largely depends on the oil. Uh, and uh, natural gas that we have, uh, luckily, uh, I have to say. Um, so it is a reality. Uh, we have so many uh, oil and gas platforms as well, uh, more than 10,000 platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and uh, we have uh, thousands of kilometers of uh, pipelines uh, all the way around the, the coast of the Gulf from Veracruz to Campeche. Um, and we have uh, all sorts of uh, different uh, environmental uh, conditions there. We, we are in a region that is also subject to hurricanes. Um, we have very, very large uh, water depths uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, more than 2,000 meters. And nevertheless, uh, there are a lot of oil and gas platforms. There's a big uh, chunk of uh, man-made platforms and devices uh, put in the water there who are operational now. So, and, and another important thing that probably you, you, I don't know if it is new or not for you, but all these platforms, they use an incredible amount of power. Um, I, I was looking at some uh, statistics numbers and 5% uh, of the whole, of the whole production in the platforms is used as fuel. Uh, so imagine this 5% uh, from the whole 50% of the world's uh, energy supply. So that is also huge. Uh, and uh, the way they do it, well, they just use diesel power generators or natural gas turbines. 
Uh, furthermore, sometimes they have two or three times the, the, um, the capacity just for redundancy, just in case something goes wrong with one unit, they can install the second unit. So there is a, a large amount of power. And um, if you know what is, uh, well, I, I, I cannot, normally I would make a poll, but uh, since I cannot see the, the screen or what you type in the chat, I uh, wanted to, to see that uh, or ask you if you knew how, how much power is installed in the average uh, oil and gas platform, at least in the North Sea. And that goes from 20 to 60 megawatts, which it's, um, that's a lot of power, right? So if you, if you think now that we, let's say we have uh, 12, uh, 12 megawatts, uh, which are the largest offshore wind turbines at the moment, probably you will need five of those just to power one single of these platforms. And we have so many of these platforms, not only in the North Sea, in Mexico and Latin America. So I think this is a good opportunity um, also for uh, um, to try to find solutions on how we can use renewables to support this oil and gas sector. So in my opinion, it's not only that we are shifting towards this new offshore industry, which is necessary because of climate change, and because it will become cheaper, because, uh, well, we're building a better future, but um, also the other way around. Uh, we also need to look for cleaner and more sustainable and efficient subsea oil and gas production. And there's a big market for it. You, you have seen that even the, the percentages are even higher still for oil and gas than what is currently being done now. Um, so I think there are some uh, important things there that I don't know it's because we just want to completely switch to renewable energy, but I think the synergies are very important to explore. And of course, this is not new. Some countries are already looking into this, uh, especially Norway. Um, as you know, Norway also has a lot of oil and gas, uh, and they are also um, known uh, because they invest also a lot in uh, renewable energy development. So they, they also have some ideas on how to integrate, for example, offshore wind farms with their oil and gas platforms. And uh, could be even more interesting if we try to power the equipment that is behind all this, uh, these platforms, because these platforms, uh, normally they, they have all kinds of components. You need to power cranes, pumps, um, all the hoist for the cables, you need all kinds of equipment. Um, and, and of course, there are many challenges. Uh, one of them is that we need uh, typically interrupted power supply. And of course, uh, because of just the nature uh, of the wind is an intermi intermittent um, source or what is called now variable renewable energy. Um, there's also a strong um, point of uh, attention to look for reliability and redundancy in all of the oil and gas components. Uh, autonomy, um, the access to a grid or to the electrical grid is not always possible. And, and this is true, especially if you're really uh, far from shore, if you're really, really offshore in deep water locations. Um, and by deep water locations, I'm talking of 2,000, 3,000 meters of water depth. And, and here is also something um, interesting to mention. When we talk about offshore wind, when we talk about shallow waters, we talk about um, somewhere between zero and 20, 20 meters, up to 60 meters is still kind of, okay, um, medium water depth. But when, when we are more than 100 meters in the offshore wind context, it's already deep water. For the oil and gas, deep water means 1,000 uh, meters or more water depth. So there's also some, uh, some, uh, some differences there. And um, many technical challenges that we need to tackle if we want to combine both. Uh, for example, how are we going to bring the power that is being produced uh, above the surface and bring it all the way down to, for example, power our oil equipment? So we need to deal with uh, the, the transmission as well and the utilization. And uh, because this probably this power is not constant all the time, um, we already know there will be a large need for energy storage. 
and because we do not have a grid where we can demand all the power that we need. So this is um, very important. And now this is bit now the direction I would like to take in, the, in this presentation to see what are also the opportunities there. And, and um, here is a graph that shows the average capacity factors for different renewable energy technologies. And uh, you already see that um, uh, offshore wind has a better capacity factor than onshore wind. And that, has, um, that is because in offshore, we have a more uh, a steadier resource than onshore, but we also have seasonal variability. We also have intermittency of the, of the, of the resource. Um, it will never be 100%. And remember that capacity factor has nothing to do with efficiency. It has to do more with the right selection of the technology to make better utilization of the resource. You, you might be having um, technology which is 100% of capacity factor, but maybe you're wa wasting all the resource. Um, so that's also not a good, um, a good solution. So I think it's normally between this uh, 50 and 60% when that for offshore wind has been proven that it can also make the best economical case for the, the lowest uh, levelized cost of energy. And uh, there are even some figures of floating, uh, floating wind, um, but uh, you can see that at least from these predictions, the capacity factor changes quite a lot because the technology is still in a kind of um, prototype stage. Um, as I think as it will develop, it will become more steady and constant, similar to what is in offshore wind. Probably a bit with capacity factors a bit higher because of uh, more steady, even more steady resource if you're far, far, far from shore with the deeper, deeper waters. Um, but we have to deal with this. And uh, one um, of the technologies we looked at that we identified as a potential solution where we could use these variable renewable energies are the water injection units. These water injection units are devices that are needed uh, subsea uh, so that they can inject uh, water to the oil and gas uh, reservoirs and increase the oil recovery rate. And these units needs to be um, uh, on their constant supply of power. The good thing is that they are more flexible. They, they can adjust easily to the, to the amount of power you can supply, uh, and they can start and stop quite easily. Of course, there is a maximum number of uh, stops and start operations that are allowed uh, per year, uh, one of these units, and um, they more or less use between one or three uh, megawatts. Um, so I think this can be good, uh, a good, let's say, load for uh, combining it with the offshore wind, uh, at least uh, for a first feasibility study. And, and that's what I did with uh, uh, this uh, PhD student, uh, looking at uh, this kind of units and see what we could do with them. Um, and of course, the next was looking at uh, all the possibilities for the energy storage. And uh, you know, this is a whole topic in itself. There are many ways of how we can store energy uh, from an electrical way, thermally, chemically, with uh, hydrogen, electrochemically, in general, just about the fuel cells and uh, batteries. Uh, but uh, well, as mechanical engineers, uh, we felt more comfortable also now looking at what were the mechanical options, not only because um, they um, can offer the largest amount of energy in terms of uh, storage, which is what we need when we are looking at uh, multi-megawatt applications, uh, but also because we found there is some potential for us also to contribute. Um, and there are already some solutions being explored. Uh, this is, for example, uh, hydro-pneumatic energy storage that uh, is proposed by a small company in a from Malta, but now they are located in the Netherlands, in Delft. They're called the uh, Flask, looking at this, uh, how to compress um, air and, and, and hydraulics in a combined way. And they propose to do that or integrate that in, in the floater of uh, in structure, in the floating structure of floating offshore wind turbine. And uh, they have been quite uh, in the media lately. And there are other 
offshore companies uh, looking, for example, at um, this is pumped uh, hydro. Uh, it's in the, like in the conventional hydro storage we we know in the mountains where you fill and empty a basin and you use the um, the, the waterhead as driving force. But now, if you do this at the bottom of the sea and uh, reverse it, you can think that uh, you have 2,000 meters of uh, water column above you. So use that as a driving force. Uh, of course, these are just ideas. Uh, what they are looking at is nothing um, more than that. And some feasibility analysis. Um, but we are also interested in two, two, two more options. One is the gravity energy storage. Um, imagine you can also store energy in the form of uh, potential energy. Uh, and if you just drop some weights um, towards the bottom of the sea, and, and you can uh, recover some of that uh, potential energy. Uh, and uh, there's people have uh, looked at it uh, with some, uh, also they had some ideas. In the first one on the left, there was this idea of, of dropping these uh, very heavy weights uh, to, to the to the seabed, and there, there there was a robot trying to pick them pick them up and putting it putting them back, um, and also this kind of structures of how to support them, um, and they are quite big, uh, also uh, about a hundred tons uh, of weight for each of these units, um, but um, well we for offshore applications we didn't really find that. That, uh, that much information. Um, we found more information on something similar, but it's based on the buoyancy uh, energy storage. And uh, here is just a schematic to illustrate uh, very briefly how, how it works. So instead of using the, the weights from the object, uh, we use the, um, the buoyancy that, the, the, that it can have when an object is, is completely submerged in water. And, and try to use some kind of system to, um, to let it, uh, to reel it or to let it flow to, to generate uh, or to store the, the, the energy. Um, and for this, uh, there are some people working on it already in the University of Innsbruck. They are looking at, um, at, um, at, uh, at big platforms that they can just um, by its weight uh, sink and in that way, they can uh, put uh, water into turbine. And if they pump, and if they pump, uh, they, the platforms then can uh, can lift. Um, and uh, there are also in the university in, in Canada, uh, some people are looking at using some kind of uh, balloons, as you can see. Um, and uh, also in the Emirates, they are looking also for different kind of buoys uh, to, to do this. Um, of course, the, the large water depths also also a problem um, technical uh, for a technical challenge in how to deal structurally with these very large uh, water pressures. And, and um, the the other good aspect of these mechanical systems is that they have very high efficiencies compared to other systems. Um, both the gravity and the buoyancy systems have. Uh, Ground trip efficiencies that are above, above 80% and even close to 90%. So that's also something quite um, desirable. And uh, last but not least, uh, the technology readiness level of, of these ideas is very low, which means that uh, most of the ideas are still at the research and development phase, which give us a good potential for us, at least as university or academic institute, to, to contribute to the development. Um, and there's uh, many options and many, you know, it's uh, uh, there's still uh, quite good opportunities to, to provide new solutions or to think differently and to, and to propose to work on those. So based on this, um, and we got also far more inspiration from the oil and gas sector. Um, and this, what you see, is uh, this um, a semi-submersible uh, structure, this kind of square unit that you see. Uh, and that, that is, then is, um, is, is semi-submersible, but is supported to the seabed with uh, lines at very high uh, tension. So it's a tension-length tension length platform. 
And normally it's used close to, to these vessels called FPSOs, and basically they're um, floating production storage, uh, for, um, storage and offloading of energy, but it's nothing more than just like a floating uh, oil production. And, and they have these risers uh, where they can transport all the, the oil or, or gas, uh, and they need to be connected all the way to the, to the wells and the reservoirs and the seabed. So they are using this kind of units with two functions. One is to help to alleviate the weight uh, of, this, uh, of the risers, uh, so they can uh, help to support part of that. And on the other hand, they provide also some stability for any um, vibrations or movements, uh, because you can imagine that most of the, 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 these, these risers are subject to, to, to currents and, and to the motion of the, of the vessel. And um, it's a good way to try to compensate for those and to alleviate the dynamic loads that, uh, if, uh, that can be experienced by these risers. So we got some inspiration on, on this and uh, proposed something like this, which is basically what we are working now. Um, we call this the Subsea Buoyancy Gravity Energy Storage System, SBGs, uh, uh, as, as we like to call it. And the idea is, is going for uh, places with deep water locations, um, about around 2,000 meters, where we could use floating wind turbines, and where, for example, we are about to power one of these uh, water injection units at the, at the seabed. Um, and we can use a platform that is similar to the one I show for the risers, uh, also with tension legged. Um, kind of mooring uh, structure. And the idea is to combine both gravity and um, buoyancy systems. And the reason for that is that we can compensate the, the, the loads that both systems can have in structure. And uh, by having also very large water depths, we can also take advantage of most of the let's say, a storage capacity that can provide both the floaters and the weights. So when we have an excess of energy, we would uh, normally use this energy to reel off, um, the, let's say, the, the floaters or pull the weights off towards the structure. And when we need some of the power in the units, uh, we can just let the floaters go or drop the weights and if we do this in a synchronized uh, manner, uh, also the, the, the loads exerted in the, in the unit or in the platform will, will decrease or will be compensated. Um, and, and, and this is also the way we can see it. So instead of looking at risers, we look at supporting some of these uh, cables that go from the floating wind turbines to the SPDs and uh, from there to the water injection unit. Um, and we would have the energy storage there with this system of floaters and, uh, and weights. And, and the idea is quite simple. I think anyone can uh, understand it. Um, and of course, the, the amount of power will depend really more on the size of the floater and the weights uh, and, and the force that is being controlled. Mechanical power is force times velocity. So if we can control the velocity and the forces, we can also control the power. And uh, here is just one of um, some uh, results that we um, um, already obtained uh, together with Andre. And uh, we have master's student looking first uh, feasibility study. And this is the case, uh, I think this is a case study for Brazil, um, where you see on the left-hand side, the wind resource. Uh, you see that in this location, which is also 2,000 meters wide, that uh, oil, it's a very big oil and gas uh, system where they're going to put new FPSOs and they don't know how they can uh, power some of their units. Um, apparently, if they want to process a lot of the gas in that field, uh, they need more than 100 megawatt of installed capacity in one of the support vessels. And if you go above 100 megawatt of installed capacity, then uh, your vessel needs to go for special regulations because it's already considered a power plant. 
So you can also see that there are also some political uh, motivations behind uh, practical motivations. So say, okay, maybe we can use something else. In this case, we decided we could uh, go for offshore wind. Um, the offshore wind resource is uh, average above eight meters per second, but you also see strong um, 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 changes in the resource uh, for different months, especially during April, May, or September and October. And this is also reflected in the power which can be provided, that, uh, and you can see that in the graph below. So the average power at the end is uh, a bit below six megawatts, and uh, only a few times we really reach the 12 megawatts of this very, very large uh, wind turbine. So probably this wouldn't be the right uh, choice of turbine for this, um, for this location, but we nevertheless, we wanted to use it as, as, as a case study because it's also kind of a reference uh, turbine that is being used uh, now in a lot of projects. Um, and then we use that uh, power that variable power and try to couple it with uh, the requirements that were needed by this water injection unit to try to see what was the required capacity or uh, and what was the required uh, energy storage capacity needed. Um, and uh, from some simulations, uh, we, we found that if we wanted to provide uh, the required flow and that you can see in the top right graph, um, the minimum required average uh, flow uh, which is uh, a bit below 500 cubic meters per hour of water. That's a lot of water that we need. Um, that uh, we could uh, more or less provide that within certain range. Of course, this is all with uh, statistics. Um, and, uh, and, and on the bottom uh, graph, what we uh, you can see is the number of uh, start and stop. So. There are some operation modes when, of course, if we don't have uh, power either from storage or from the wind, we need to stop the unit, um, and we will. And uh, when the resource picks up, or when there is enough energy storage, we, we can start the unit again. Of course, we need to minimize those start-stop operations. So there's a kind of average maximum number of these operations we can do per year, uh, which is um, a number of seventy. But at least with, with the capacity storage that we found, we well around 30, so well below or very low probability of having a higher number of stops uh, per year. Um, hey, Antonio, if I may interrupt, we are um, two minutes away from your, from your okay. time. So if you would round up, please. Yes, I'm uh, almost uh, wrapping up. Um, so yeah, thank you, Eduardo. Um, I, I just really forgot to mention, that, for example, we're also using uh, reanalysis uh, models, ERA-5, to get all the offshore wind data at 100 meters uh, height um, for 40 years of, uh, for 40 years. And uh, based on that, we started with the more or less pre-selection pre and sizing of the, of the units. Um, we found that, um, Cover these eight megawatt hours, we actually need uh, eight of this system just to have some symmetry and balance of forces with the floats and weights. Um, and at the end, each of our SVG units can provide around 10 megawatt hours. Um, of course, there's a lot of work that we still need to do. Um, well, we are starting with the basis of design based on the, on the needs and constraints. Uh, of course, some variability of the renewable resource uh, and looking, of course, at how will be the levelized cost of energy storage. But uh, besides this feasibility, there's a number of more in detail uh, aspects in, on the technical part. Uh, synchronization effects from the swinging of these floats and weights uh, so that we avoid uh, collisions. Um, and uh, also, we need to minimize the potential for uh, vortex induced vibrations that can be caused if there are currents, as is the case in, in Brazil or in Mexico. Um, and uh, that can also introduce some interesting uh, dynamics that uh, we, we need to consider. Of course, the ener energy management and control of the units. Uh, and uh, you, you can imagine also the installation method is not uh, quite uh, trivial. As you are 2,000 meters or 1,000 meters uh, water depth, uh, or sorry, in the water column, 
and bring these huge systems there and how to install them. But uh, with that, I would like them to conclude. Um, and I think also the message is that we are still looking for a lot of uh, engineers and technical people in the sector. Um, we are going to need uh, educated people for this offshore, new offshore industry powered by renewables. And um, I hope with that, I can give you a bit of uh, an idea of some of the potential and opportunities we, we have and the, the projects we are working with at, at the TU Delft. Um, so thank you very much and uh, happy to answer any, any questions if, if you have some. And um, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, uh, Professor Harkin Laguna. And now I invite questions or comments from the, from the audience. Um, as I commented in the chat, if you if you uh, feel more com comfortable to to write your your questions or comments, please uh, go ahead and do it do it in the in the chat. And oh yes, uh, Nadia uh, reminds me that we should react to um, to uh, uh, Tonyo's uh, uh, talk <laughs> and uh, where we are. Uh, clapping with uh, so soundless uh, claps. Okay, um, so is there any uh, is there any uh, question or comment that we that you would be uh, liking to to make to the speaker? You're welcome to raise your hands or. I have a question, Pedro. Uh, yes, Osvaldo, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Antonio, for your presentation. Um, I, I just want to, uh, could you please comment a little bit more about the specific backgrounds that you visualize that will be needed to develop these kind of projects um, in, in provide these specific solutions uh, in, in the uh, these wind power offshore solutions. Could you please comment a little bit more which areas or backgrounds are, are needed? Thank you. Um, uh, that's a very good question, Osvaldo. I believe that uh, if you look at the offshore wind as well, now uh, there's a need of uh, engineers in different uh, disciplines. I, I, I wouldn't dare to say we only need either mechanical or electrical engineers or um, aerospace, uh, you know, it's, I, I think uh, the, or at least in my view, it's really more in the synergies of how this um, in, in the fields of what, of what is needed to, to understand how, uh, especially if we are going to look for, for new applications like uh, these ones, where the constraints from uh, one field uh, are no longer there for, for the other disciplines. So I think here we really need at first, at least in, at, the, at the level that we are looking at it, that a kind of integrated approach of knowing how to all, all pieces uh, match together. Of course, as, as the technology develops, there will be room for optimizations and more in detailed um, analysis for a specific uh, discipline. But um, in general, I, I mean, you can see that. Uh, well, from um, uh, fluid mechanics in all the hydrodynamic loadings, uh, control, uh, mechanical engineering, uh, uh, structural engineers, uh, also when you look at this uh, platform itself. Um, in Delft, we have offshore engineers looking at all the operations, installations, and handling. Um, so I, I think there's room for all the disciplines. Uh, and the energy storage part, of course, and the electrical system part. Um, I, I think there's room for everyone. Thank you very much, Anthony. Okay, is there anyone, anyone else wanting to make a comment? I don't see any hands recent. And so, uh, but I, I've got a, a question for you, Antonio, uh, if you would. Um, I was a little bit surprised when you mentioned that gravity energy storage or the buoyancy energy storage, uh, I think that, that this comment applies to, to the two of them, are 90% efficient. If I'm correct in, the, in, the, in this point, then it, it's very surprising for me because 
the the the, mm, the devices that you're using for for the, um, uh, the floating or or, or um, sinking, uh, they they will have to face the resistance of uh, motion in in water, which is very the the viscosity of water is is very large. So the drag coefficient will be huge. And I wonder, I, I, I'm surprised that it would be 90% efficient. I don't know if you can comment on that, please. Yeah, I, I don't think what you mentioned is included in that efficiency. This is more the efficiency of the energy capture. Uh, um, to the, it's, it's the round trip efficiency, right? So what it says is that also these devices, normally they would not degrade also over time in terms of, uh, Capacity, but uh, also the, the 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 way we we storage or uh, we go in this case from the mechanical motion to to the electrical motion, uh, it's it's a bit that high. Uh, I think what you mentioned is more on how the the motion of the of the of the floats or the waves themselves, right? Because the, the, but but I think that is not included. That is something different. However, those we are also limited on those. We we are not interested in making them go so high, um, and so we want, I think, one meter per second of uh, velocity, um, and also with the balance of a force and, and velocity as a power. Um, so there's also some play there, but but I don't think the efficiency uh, looks into those kind of uh, parameters. The, th this would be a different calculation uh, in, in the sense that uh, we don't know how how much of the energy that uh, was uh, put in would be um, uh, taken out because some of it will be gi uh, uh, given to the to, to the water that is surrounding the devices. Am I right? Yes, but in terms, I mean, uh, if you think about potential energy, it, it will has to go up or the device will have to go down completely, even if these uh, forces, those forces will slow down the motion, but the energy itself contained, it's still conserved. Uh, you, you have all this. So it, there, there is a trade-off uh, there uh, indeed, but the efficiency in itself can be as high as, as at least 90%, 80% of round trip efficiency. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just to mention something in, in Germany, they are already trying these gravity energy storage systems, uh, but not offshore, only on land. And uh, they are even doing it underground. So they're making big holes in, in the ground for these gravity storage systems. Um, okay, well, um, I, I think I, I would like to, to take a, a more detailed uh, a look at, um, at, at the idea, but thank you very much for your for uh, your uh, clarification. I, I, before we finish, I want to read the comment from Carla Cardenas. Uh, uh, she says, I really enjoyed your presentation. It's the first time I hear about the subjis, <laughs> uh, the way you, you liked to, to call them, the sub buoyancy, gravity, etc. cetera. Um, and she uh, thanks you. Okay, well, uh, let's, um, Let's uh, uh, um, stop here and, and react again to the, um, uh, Anthony Harking's presentation. Thank you very much for, for sharing with us your, your ideas. Thank you, Eduardo. It's been a pleasure.